The Italian Air Force and the National Research Council have definitely used their curiosity to fuel their exciting experiments being conducted on board today. They are using the suborbital space lab to the fullest. One of the experiments being conducted on board today is the neuroplasticity experiment. This is a passive experiment consisting of cell culture flasks containing human neural cells in cultures that will fly in a pocket of the researcher's flight suit. The experiment will test the ability to maintain stem cells in culture during suborbital flight and test the early effects of hypergravity, or high Gs, and microgravity, or low Gs, on neuroplasticity, which is the ability for cells to adapt to their environment. Data from this flight will be used for insight into physiology and pathology, but also be able to use, be used to investigate biological processes for human, human spaceflight future missions and to study and develop new agents for therapeutic purposes for people here on Earth. Now, this is just one of many experiments on board for this mission the crew will be looking after. And speaking of the crew, JR, can we get an update? Yeah, so we're about four minutes out currently uh, at this point, and the pilots are ensuring the spaceship is in the launch configuration after going through the various L-10 checks, confirming that all the set settings are go for launch. This is also when Spaceship Unity will isolate the air supply from EVE and prime the rocket motor by opening the backup oxidizer valve. Once these actions are complete, the pilots will seek clearance from the MCC, that's shorthand for the Mission Control Center, for release. So, MCC is, it consists of experts from various disciplines and departments across the company, and they're verifying checks with our crew every step of the way. I don't know about you all, but I can feel the anticipation building just watching the screen. I can only imagine what it would be like to be on board right now. It must be incredibly exciting. Uh, exciting is definitely an understatement at this point. Um, you're just anticipating the release. I can, can't imagine what the crew is, is feeling. And they're anticipating the release and really everything that happens afterwards. So maybe, JR, you could give us a quick yes. overview of the profile? Yeah. After release, the, the crew lights the rocket motor, and Unity's trajectory to space begins in that horizontal release position before turning towards space, a maneuver we call the gamma turn. The rest of the rocket motor burn will occur in the vertical, and everything after release through the completion of the rocket motor burn is called boost. Boost is only one of multiple phases of flight that our unique system experiences. After boost is feather. Now, sometimes when we say feather, we mean the tails of the spaceship, and sometimes we're referring to moving these tails into what we call the feathered configuration. It can be confusing, but I'll try to be clear what I mean when I say feathered today. So due to the law of conservation of momentum, feathering the vehicle, that's rotating the tails to 60 degrees, causes the cabin of unity to start a backflip maneuver as it approaches our next phase, apogee. And this backflip is a key part of the experience because it maximizes the view of the Earth below. Our pilots use the RCS, that's a reaction control system, to hold the spaceship in that attitude, and then at the right time, the pilots will again use the RCS to continue that backflip all the way around. This prepares the vehicle for reentry. In the feathered configuration, the vehicle presents a large area of the wing to the atmosphere, allowing our system to burn off energy while still high in the thin atmosphere. And then after reentry, the feather is once again lowered and locked, turning Unity into a glider. It's in this configuration that the pilots will fly back to Spaceport America in what we refer to as the glide phase. You see, our system is capable of acting like a capsule when that's most beneficial and acting like a glider when that's most beneficial. Now, MCC's in my ear. They're telling us we're one minute away from release. Our next set and our last set of checks before release are L-30. That's 30 seconds to release. And Spaceship Unity pilots will arm the launch pylon and once we get to that designated launch point, the mothership pilots will engage the release, setting Unity free. Meanwhile, the spaceship pilots will push forward on the stick all the way, preparing for a release. We're now approximately 20 seconds from release. Ten. Five, three, two, one, release, release, release. Ignition. Good control. 
trimming. That's turning, pulling the nose up. And trim is set. We're now traveling at approximately Mach 1.4. There's max Q, that's the maximum dynamic pressure on the vehicle. Those on board are experiencing about three Gs at the moment. The trim is complete and Unity is in the vertical headed towards space. Mach 2. Mach 2.8, rocket motor cutoff. Amazing. All right. Predicted apogee today is 275,000 feet. That's 84.3 kilometers. Incredible. Our mission specialists have been cleared to unstrap and enjoy the zero-G experience. This is amazing. This, what you're seeing is uh, Colonel Villa Day going to the back to tend to the payloads that are mounted on the rack. You can see Landolfi and Leo starting their experiments in their seat and having, it looks like, a great time, <laughs> of course. Yep. The feather is moving, as you can see. Starting that backflip maneuver I spoke of, the feather is now fully up. Amazing. And viva la Italia! This is a hundred years for the Italian Air Force. So happy centennial to the Air Force. This is absolutely incredible. And welcome to space astronauts. How absolutely incredible. Ben, 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 benvenito nello espacio. Congratulations to Walter, Angelo, and Leo on becoming astronauts today. And a special congratulations to our pilot Nicola for his first space flight. Welcome back to space, Mike and Colin. This is absolutely incredible. Wonderful. You can see I'm tripping over my words because I can see <laughs> all the excitement here. And we've also trained our astronauts as part of our training program to, at Apogee, go to the window and take a look outside. So you're seeing them take a look and really t reflect and take in the view because all of the science and all of the research that they're conducting on board is for that vehicle, for that, that planet that they're looking out on. Mm -hmm. It's really that science and research being invested back into this planet. And it's important for them to reflect and see where their hard work is going. Right. We have uh, achieved apogee at 85.1 kilometers or 279,000 feet. Incredible. The pilots are currently doing the, completing the backfill maneuver uh, orienting the vehicle for re-entry. Now, just before 0.1 Gs, the pilots will give that return to, uh, uh, return to seats call to the mission specialists. And our training team has worked this portion of the flight out so that it's very natural and intuitive for our passengers. You know, when we talk about space travel, a lot of people know and they expect the boost portion of flight to be loud and thrilling, and of course it is. But what's interesting is that the re-entry is actually very similar. So as supersonic air flowing over our vehicle in the feathered configuration, shock waves form on top of the cabin, and those are audible to those inside. And for those of you on site here at Spaceport America watching from the ground, you should hear a double sonic boom as Spaceship Unity once again breaks the sound barrier. We're currently at Mach 2.5. Incredible. And just back to 1G as we begin reentry. And those views are just absolutely Amazing. Yes. So for reentry, we're now at um, about 3.6 Gs uh, for those on board. The crew will um, orient the attitude of the spaceship so that when we come out of reentry and feather down, we'll be uh, pointed toward spaceport. We're now subsonic. And, and at 75,000 feet. And the unique uh, part of our design is as a, as a vehicle that can get into this con feathered configuration, we're a glider, we're, we're a rocket, we're a glider, and we're a capsule at the right phases of flight that help our unique design be, be safe and effective for the mission it's at. 
that's right. We're at 61,000 feet now, continuing to descend in the feathered configuration. When we get down to about 53,000 feet, the pilots will lower, command lower of the feather again and turn, reconfigure the vehicle back into a glider. The views are just so incredibly amazing all the way down, and it's just part of each phase of flight has its unique experience. Mm -hmm. It has the ability to also conduct science. Our payloads that are on the rack are conducting and recording data all the way through each phase of flight. So you get hypergravity and, and low gravity data and that transition in between. The feather is almost completed the feather down. It is now down and locked. Those watching from Spaceport America, now is a great time to go outside. Unity will be coming into view and you can cheer on the crew as they return to Earth. Now, the mission specialists on the flight are supported by an incredible team on the ground from both the Air Force and the Center for National Research in Italy, who designed and developed the research being conducted on board. Space-based research is an incredible capability that is being opened up by suborbital vehicles like our own space flight system. One of, the re one of the researchers utilizing this capability to the fullest is here with us in the studio. I'm so excited. A future an astronaut, a friend, and a space-based researcher, Kelly Girardi. Welcome to the studio. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay, I gotta ask, how are you feeling having watched this incredible crew go to space today knowing that you're gonna be there on a future space flight? It's surreal, I have to say. <laughs> Just the energy outside, and I've had the benefit from being on this side of the live stream for a number of Virgin Galactic space flights, including yours. And it's so special to experience that here at Spaceport America with the crew and their families and the Virgin Galactic workforce and mission control. And it's emotional. I, I remember during your space flight when I heard release, 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 I burst into tears and I'm glad that my mic was off during the live cast, but it's the profundity of human spaceflight and I'm so ready to be on the other side of this live stream. It's incredible. I mean, this is my sixth spaceflight and you probably saw I was tripping over my words. I just couldn't get it out because of the excitement. Exactly. And so you're on a future dedicated research mission. Could you tell us a little bit about the science that you're going to be conducting? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm flying on a dedicated research mission. I am representing my research institute the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences, and I'm going to be doing healthcare and fluid research in space. I'll be wearing a wearable sensor system to take biometric monitoring. It's called the AstroSkin. It's currently worn by astronauts on the International Space Station, but my flight will be the first time we're collecting data during the launch, reentry, and landing phases of flight as well. And then fluid research to help design. I'm going to be looking at how fluid behaves in a container in microgravity during flight. And that can help inform new designs for life support systems or syringe design for administering medication in space, things like that. So I'm very excited. That's, I can't wait. <laughs> Me too. I cannot wait. So what role do you see suborbital vehicles like VSS Unity playing in, the, in future research? Yeah, it's critical. I mean, this is a new era of access to space, and there is a tidal wave of scientific research that can benefit from this platform. You know, we've done a lot of work, a decade of work here on Earth, iterating with payloads, payload operations, technology iteration, international collaboration, parabolic flight campaigns, where the aircraft takes that roller coaster profile here on Earth, where you get short bursts of microgravity. That's amazing for quickly iterating on technology, but to really validate it, you, you need high quality microgravity and you need longer duration exposure to microgravity. You need to be in space. And so I'm really looking forward to the availability of Virgin Galactic as a platform, not just for the scientific community, but for academia, for students, for so many. So I'm so excited to get to be a part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um so I know you didn't plant, you did not plant this question. Everyone watching should not plant this question, but Kelly, I loved your book, not necessarily a rocket <laughs> I did not plant that question. <laughs> but part of the appeal of suborbital vehicles is it really opening up the aperture of who can do science and technology. Yeah. And this is just another science lab for people to utilize to further whatever field of research that they're in. Can you talk about some of the other research fields that are utilizing these kinds of capabilities, maybe even at IAS? Yeah, absolutely. It's really multidisciplinary. It's not just space science. Uh, my colleagues come from such a wide variety of backgrounds and fields of research. 
I've been particularly motivated by some of my colleagues who are doing research related in space related to the quality of human life here on Earth, human health and well-being, whether that's biomedical or pharmaceutical research or even new ways to approach telemedicine or, you know, technical instruction for remote or extreme environments. I just think those are use cases that are so compelling and interesting to me to really use space to benefit life here on Earth. It's absolutely amazing. And I love how you speak about this industry because you've been an advocate and a part of this industry for a while. And can you talk about what drew you to the commercial space side? Yeah, absolutely. I have long been an evangelist for the commercial space flight industry, and I've really been inspired by it. I have a deeply rooted belief in the potential of this industry to open up access to space, to truly democratize access to space, certainly for science communities and for the research community like myself and the crew of Galactic 01, but I also for civilians of all disciplines. I really do believe that the space age is a broader cultural movement and that our next giant leap will require the talents of artists, engineers, and everyone in between. Space is our shared past and our shared future, and that's why I wrote not necessarily rocket science. <laughs> Okay, well, we're going to be getting to landing soon, but I wanted to ask if you had any parting thoughts before I release you to go cheer on the crew as they return to Earth. Yeah, just awe, excitement. I'm sure you can tell. I'm just, you know, it's amazing to be here. And just deep appreciation for all that goes into this and all that this means. I know this is the beginning of routine and regular commercial operations, but to me, it will never get old. Oh my God, thank you so much for <laughs> thank joining you. us here. Thank you. I'm going to run down and welcome that crew back. <laughs> thank you, Thanks. Kelly. All right, that, this is just an absolutely exciting time for the research community. I mean, the excitement yes, off of Kelly is absolutely. just palpable, and I can't wait for us to be cheering her on as she does her research in science and space soon. So, let's check in with our crew on their descent back to Earth. Absolutely. So, we are just over 11,000 feet. Uh, for those of you here on site, Unity just crossed over the field and is making another uh, uh, circle around in the pattern. Uh, beginning those landing approach, um, uh, passing the waypoints that we've designated as part of our energy management plan. So <clears throat> the pilots have uh, joined up with Chase in the pattern and they're discussing that energy management plan. They're going to be landing today on runway 34. That means from south to north. Uh, and for those non-pilots tuning in, those numbers represent the first two numbers on the mag magnetic heading of the compass for the runway direction. So for example, 3-4 is 340 degrees. The landing gear is now down and locked. We have three green, that means all gear are down and locked. And we're making our final approach to the runway here at Spaceport America. We like to make left-hand turns for our approach. That's because the commander is in the left seat, and that provides the best line of sight for them as they come in to the landing. Now, the runway here at Spaceport America is 12,000 feet long. That's 3.7 kilometers and 200 feet wide, or 61 meters. One thousand feet above the runway. 500 feet. 500 Over the threshold, that's the beginning of the runway. And you'll see the pilots hold the nose up. That's a uh, flare maneuver, all part of the energy management. Main gear touchdown. So the pilots will continue to hold the nose gear in the air as we continue to bleed off some energy as we run down the runway. And at the designated airspeed, they will lower the nose gear as well. Nose gears down, 